Hi, everybody. This is Kara Thrasher Livingston with Senior and Disability Services, and I'm here with uh, Jetta Whitaker and our training team, uh, Cassandra Lynch and Delight Mills, and our uh, policy team teammate Jenny Murray to talk with you about home and community based waiver amendments. Uh, we just like to do a little bit of um, introductory housekeeping at the beginning of our session here. We have lots of people joining us here today, so it really helps if we spend a minute or two talking about how to get the best experience out of the webinar, and it also gives people time to join in. So I just wanted to make sure that you know you're in the right place for this webinar um, and to point out a couple of the controls and features of the webinar uh, so that you're familiar with them. Um, you should see a, a little task bar, a small uh, a couple of icons that allow you to do a few things in the webinar session. Uh, today, you'll be interacting with us by text. So you'll be able to text your messages into us. We'll have a short presentation and we'll have time for Q&A. Your questions today will come in by text. And what we do is we, we read them and we summarize them. We sometimes don't have time for every single question and we tend to, um, to qualify them in terms of the theme. So if you don't hear us read out your particular question, um, no worries, don't worry, that because they're all uh, recorded and the session is recorded as well. So we will have a YouTube link available to you after the session. Um, we also have a download a handout. So you should see in your taskbar a, a section that says handouts. You'll be able to download uh, a PDF file in there. If you don't see it, don't worry. It just means that your device doesn't uh, have the capacity to download a file. Sometimes if you're attending on a phone or a tablet or something like that, you know, it doesn't do, it doesn't do downloads, that's okay. Because what we'll do is we'll send you an email after the session with the link to the recording and a copy of today's presentation. Um, so to make sure that we that you know how to uh, open your question area and write something in there. If you could please just locate questions and just type in something simple there for me. If you want to say hello, go ahead and type hi um, or tell us how the weather is in your area and whatever you'd like to say. All right. And uh, what I can see on my screen is a whole lot of people saying hello. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, and uh, joining in. Thank you for joining in, everybody. And you're doing a great job. Um, and yes, it is quite the cold day today where we are. And good, okay. So um, that is great practice in locating where the questions are. And that is where you're going to want to chat to us and ask your questions. Um, the other control that you could use is you could raise your hand. So if you can find a little, um, a little circle icon with a hand in the middle and just hit that for me. What I ask is that if people um, need to get our attention, you could use the little hand. If you have problems with audio, you could use the little hand. Um, usually we don't do uh, audio Q&A in these large, large sessions just because it's just not enough time and too many folks, um, you know, there's just so much going on. But the good news is that this isn't the only chance that you have to interact with us about this interesting topic. Um, you're able to connect with our presenter and Jetta, I'm sure you'll mention to everybody how to connect with you should there be further questions. And um, I think we're ready to go. So I think there still are folks joining in, uh, but they will join in. I don't wanna take too long with intros, um, but again, thank you everyone. Thanks for practicing with the hands and everything and um, writing to us. And so Jetta, I'd like to go ahead and, and invite you to uh, to do our presentation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kara, and welcome everyone to this hopefully informative present presentation on the proposed waiver amendments that the Alaska will be submitting to CMS later this year. And I will ask you, if you hear a barking dog in the background, please raise your hand, let me know, and I'll run out and shut a few more doors. Um, so, as I said, this is an overview of what the state of Alaska is proposing uh, and a set of waiver amendments. Um, Alaska has five waivers currently with the federal government, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and these waiver amendments affect four of them. 
the IDD, the APDD, the CCMC, and the ISW waivers. Um, these were formally opened for public comment on December 13th through an ad in the Anchorage Daily News. Where you have to um, post an ad in the, the newspaper with the largest circulation in the state, which is why it's Anchorage-based, and then also through the online public notice system in order to meet the requirements for CMS of adequate public notice. Um, the, the minimum number of days is 30 days, but we've extended this to about, I think it's 42 altogether, um, so that they will close, a public comment will close on Tuesday, January 25th at five o'clock. You know, we like to add a few extra days to cover the holiday period and to give people not feeling like 30 uh, days includes the weekends, but only the work week. I'm going to give you just a brief overview of what waivers and amendments mean. So if you've been with us a long time, you've heard this before, but if you're new to it, this might help set the stage. Um, states are allowed to offer alternatives to Medicaid's mandatory institutional care benefit by waiving that required benefit and offering home and community-based services in addition to offering institutional care. Uh, home and community-based services are are waived through the 1915C section of the Social Security Act, but we use the term waiving from the required benefit of institutional care. Sometimes individuals think they have a waiver, and it's okay to think that, but technically individuals are recipients that are enrolled on a waiver, and Alaska has five waivers. Some states have many more, some states have fewer, but we have five waivers currently with the federal government. And people are enrolled in particular waivers. You can't be on two waivers at once. Um, waivers are generally granted um, by CMS to operate for a five-year period. And during each five years, um, states are able to make changes to the approved wa uh, waivers, the content of the waivers, by submitting amendments. So we just went through the renewal period, and I'll get into this in a minute, for four of Alaska's five waivers, and um, we haven't submitted amendments to those four yet, and you'll see that in what I'll show you in the numbering system. So the process is for an amendment, you craft the language, you make the changes in what's called the waiver management system, which is a big database. And Jenny Murray is in charge of managing that workload right now. Um, you print out the pages that are being amended and you engage in public comment with your stakeholders, which is what we're doing right now. And then you take those comments and you, if you need to, amend some of the language that is contained in the proposed amendments and you submit it to CMS and then CMS has 90 days to um, approve the amendment or stop the clock and ask more questions. If they don't respond at all within 90 days, it does become effective. But we've built in a lot of extra time in this process because we hope for a July 1st effective date. Next slide, please. I'm scrolling down through my PowerPoint to explain to you where you can look at these documents. Um, in the interests of transparency, and because CMS requires it, we post our waiver amendments and our approved waivers on a subpage of the SDS main page. This is a snip of the SDS main page. Uh, it's like the bottom half of the page, so it's not the whole content of the main page, but you'll see in the red circle that's the address for the SDS main web page, and then the red arrow points to um, where on the right-hand nav bar, if you scroll all the way down near the end of the right-hand navigation bar, you'll see AKHCBS waivers. Next uh, slide will bring you to what the content of that page is. There they are. And there's the address of that particular page circled in red, and then you, the red arrow points to the draft waiver amendments. I'd like to direct your attention to, at the top of the page there, the approved waivers. I just want to give you a little background in case you're a policy nerd like the rest of us. Um, the five approved waivers are posted there. You'll see in the top four um, a numbering system that indicates to us that 
we are in the sixth five-year renewal cycle of those four waivers, the IDD, the ALI, the APDD, and the CCMC, because there's um, a unique identifier followed by a dot R06, which means it's the sixth renewal and each waiver cycle is for five years. So we are actually in the 30 years, nearly 30 years of, of these waivers, though they did split up and, and kind of morphed into other things along the way. And after that R06 dot, there's a zero, zero. Those second numbers are reflective of how many amendments have taken place. Because we just recently renewed these four waivers, there are no amendments yet, but when these ones are approved, they will be codified as .01 waivers with a new effective date. The last one in that list is the ISW. Um, it has a, a very different 1566 number. It's um, R00, meaning it's in its first five-year period, its initial five-year period, and it has dot 13 following that. That does not mean there have been 13 amendments in the first five years. It, CMS has a kind of a confusing assignment of the waiver amendment numbers, and we don't control that. But this one ended up with dot 13. It also became effective July 1st, 2021. So there they are. They're each very long, um, 200 plus pages. And so that little text underneath that says these files have been exported from an external database. If you experience issues reading them, please contact me and we'll figure out how to get you an accessible copy. I will say that CMS thought all along the output from the waiver management system was accessible, but we just pointed out to them it is not because Alaska is committed to posting only fully accessible documents on its website. and these 200 page documents were not so cms is working with its contractor so that the output from the waiver management system will be accessible in the future in which case we will replace all of these with fully accessible documents under the draft waiver amendment section you see the four waivers <coughs> proposed waiver amendments that we're going to be talking about today um, you can click on each of those links to actually look at the documents and i'll be walking you through that in the future slides and then you see the kind of the first half of the notice of proposed amendment, the thing that went in the Anchorage Daily News and the online public notice. But because this is a screenshot, I couldn't give you the whole thing. Um, we can advance to the next slide, thanks. Um, because um, the IDD, APDD, and CCMC waivers were, were very recently renewed, most of the content does not need changing at this time. We incorporated some of the, the things we wanted to do in the renewal process. So they were approved containing that content. The only thing that at the time of renewal, we did not have full permission from CMS to do was to extend um, the, the day hab service to slightly enlarge the settings it can be provided in. Um, but so this waiver amendment for APDD, IDD, and CCMC amends Appendix C to include uh, the ability to offer a limited amount of day habilitation in residential settings. And I just want to give you the backstory on that if you hadn't heard it. Um, I know it's been announced in a few of the stakeholder meetings in the past, but um, the CMS technical guide expressly disallows DAHAB to be provided in residential settings because otherwise it would be considered residential habilitation, right? Um, but COVID flexibilities have taught us that a certain amount of day habilitation in a person, a recipient's home, is appropriate and should not be disallowed that that recipients should be able to take an occasional class in their own home with their dsp at their side to help them with the technology if it's an online class or to take their dsp with them to go to a birthday party of a friend who happens to live in a group home which is a residential setting and we've had requests to to change this for years and years and years so we finally took it to CMS and had a series of, of really great conversations with the top leadership for home and community-based waiver services at CMS, and they agreed with us. 
Um, so we're pretty proud of that. And uh, the technical guide will be changed in the future to allow a limited amount, and CMS wouldn't be held uh, accountable to how much, but they're very concerned about duplication of service. So where a support plan would need to justify a certain amount of day hab in a residential setting and not in the community, and also are concerned about um, that this day hab in a residential setting doesn't unnecessarily limit people to accessing the greater community. So with those sorts of guarantees and concerns built into a support plan, we're pretty comfortable that we can move ahead and CMS will be amending the technical guide in the future. I'm not sure when, but um, we have permission to move ahead with this. There are some, just so you know, some um, corresponding regulations out for public comment right now. The purpose of this stakeholder engagement is not to talk about the regulations, but can you hear my dogs barking? I'm sorry. Um, you can separately comment on those, but we have this built in to these three waivers and also the ISW, the special provision for day habilitation. Next slide. I'm going to focus mostly on changes to the individual supports waiver because it has the most changes in it. There are four changes proposed to this waiver. Two of them bring it into compliance with the currently approved language in the IDD waiver, which is relating to level of care and employment services. One change makes that day have change, and the final change um, amends how participants are selected to be on the waiver because the currently approved language is not how we want to do it, but that's what we thought we wanted to do when we created the ISW and it became effective back in January or July uh, 2018. So we can walk through each of these changes in the next slides. Advance, there we go. So the next one is the cover page for um, a waiver amendment. It's pretty simple. Uh, you put in which waiver and waiver number you're amending. You suggest your preferred provo uh, proposed effective date, and then you detail what you want to accomplish with this amendment. And this one, as I said, has four changes. Um, and I'm gonna, the following slides will go into those details. Next, please. There we are. The first change is modifying the description of how individuals are selected from the wait list. The current language in the ISW is exactly the same as the language for selecting waiver, waiver recipients for the IDD waiver, which is based on your DDRR score, essentially criticality. Those with higher emergent needs are more likely to be selected and your place on the waiver may change if somebody is scored higher, that may bump you down. Um, for the ISW, we decided, or the IDD unit decided, that wouldn't be appropriate since the services available on the individualized supports waiver don't tend to be the um, the ones that respond to emergency situations, like there's no 24 seven residential support or habilitation on the ISW, available through the ISW. So right now the ISW is not full. The approved waiver contains a limit of 600 people at any point in time or 620 across a year where someone may fall off and be replaced by someone else. But um, when we get to that 600th person, we will have to activate the wait list and then start pulling people, assuming this um, amendment is approved, by the date they submitted their DDR to SDS. So it becomes a date stamp approach. You will be pulled based on when you submitted your DDRR. Um, of the first time. And um, in the future, people will, as they submit their DDRRs, will be at the bottom of the list and gradually rise to the top as people are selected for entrance to the waiver. So essentially, first on, first off. Um, we've been monitoring, tracking the rate of uh, people being put on the ISW. I think we're at about 550 now. So we expect to reach capacity 
probably by the end of this fiscal year, right about hopefully when these waiver amendments take place or become effective July 1st. It's important to note that people on the ISW can still be on the wait list for IDD services. You can still be on the wait list for IDD services even if you are getting ISW services. So if you are hoping to transition over to something that has 24 seven residential care, you would want to stay on the IDD wait list even while you're receiving IS services from the ISW. I hope that's clear to everybody. Next slide. The second change in the ISW amendment is to explain how the level of care determination process has been updated. Again, this language was already approved in the IDD waiver, and so it's not new to CMS or to hopefully all of you because we received lots of public comment when we renewed the, that waiver. Um, I did not cut and paste and provide screenshots here because Appendix B6D level of care criteria and Appendix B6F process for the evaluation are actually quite long. The narratives are pages and pages, and so they wouldn't fit on a screenshot in this PowerPoint. But I invite you to go back to the web page that contains the draft waivers amendments and take a look at them there. Um, you can compare, if you want to, that the language is the same in the approved IDD waiver. Um, next slide, please. The third change in the ISW waiver uh, proposed amendment is updating the day hub service definition, just like we're submitting for the other three uh, waiver amendments that have no other content changes. Um, when a day hub is provided in a residential setting, the rendering of activities must not duplicate or replace community engagement activities afforded to all recipients of residential habilitation services. And the services must also be provided with the intent of facilitating community integration. That language is very specific because that's what CMS wants to hear. And we will be checking on that through uh, support plans that contain up to 10% of um, day hab and all from all providers um, would need to be justified in a support plan submission or an amendment to a support plan. So um, I think it's going to be a great addition to the array of services we offer. And as I said, CMS already conditionally approved this in concept. And um, so I don't expect any problems in the final review of the waiver amendments once they're submitted, but you never know. All right, next slide. And then the final change to the individualized supports waiver refers to the Appendix C updates to reflect what's already in practice with the IDD waiver um, and the regulations that went through um, recently. Employ supported employment service change names to now be called employment services and there were other changes uh, to the service definition and um, amount duration scope allowing some tele um, delivery things like that so um, again it's already approved in the idd waiver this is just catching the isw up so that it parallels or reflects all those changes and we incorporated public comment we received through the renewal of that waiver and the outcome the output is um was finalized by cms and now the isw is catching up next slide i think there's only one or two more yes public comment at the end of this process uh, will be accepted until tuesday january 25th 2022 5 p.m these are the ways you can provide your public comment. You can mail it to me. I love to get mail. You can email it. That's OK, too. Or you can put it in the chat log. I really like um, waiver amendments more than regulatory amendments because we have more freedom to interact with you. And CMS doesn't disallow use of the chat log as public comment. Unfortunately, 
the Alaska Administrative Code on how to conduct regulations, how to prepare, conduct public comment on regulations, hasn't gotten into the 21st century yet and chat logs are not allowed. We're working on um, having the Department of Law expand its scope to incorporate that because it does, it's yet another format and I think we should allow as many formats as possible for public comment to arrive at us. But right now it's just within the waiver world. So Kara is tracking the comments and the questions that are coming in through the chat box and we will use that and analyze all that chat log box, chat box log when we are uh, preparing the final uh, version of the waiver amendments before we hit submit to CMS. So January 25th is the same day that the public comment on the proposed regulations um, for the IDD level of care closes. But I don't want you to think that if you submit comments on one, they apply to the other. You have to submit your comments separately. You can comment on the waiver amendments and then also comment separately on the regulatory amendments if you have comments about that subject. Um, they go to different audiences and they have to be accounted for separately. So please, um, send, even if it's the same comment, just send it two different ways. One says waiver amendment comment, one would say regulatory amendment comment. Um, if you are going to comment, I just want to remind you on the regulations amendments and you submit your questions before January 15th, we will be issuing an FAQ to hopefully respond to all those questions shortly after January 15th. So this is just a gentle reminder. If you have questions or you're confused about what's being proposed in that package, you can submit a question by January 15th and we will attempt to answer it. But again, we cannot go into, in this forum, um, enter, entering, answering any questions about the regulations proposed. All right, next slide. I think it's the final one, which is just, oh, here's our final timeline. Again, uh, public comment ends January 25th. Tribal consultation is required also for waiver amendments, and that began at the same day, but it runs for 60 days. And so we can't submit until after tribal consultation is concluded around late February. Um, that is handled by uh, the Division of Healthcare Services. So um, it's outside of our scope, but if we get anything from tribes on these waiver amendments, we'll certainly incorporate those comments. And then the final, versions of the amendments that are submitted will account for the public comment, including any changes that are made as a result of the comment. And then we submit the amendments to CMS, hopefully by mid-March. As I said, CMS has 90 days to review the amendments and approve them or uh, send us some informal requests for additional information or even stop the clock, which then gives them more than 90 days. But we hope that because all of these things have already been uh, touched on by CMS or even approved by CMS, um, there should be no slowing down of the process and we'll reach our effective date, uh, desired effective date of July 1st with no problem. And I think that just brings us to the question slide. Yep. So Kara will be reading questions from the chat box if you have any. And we have another 30 minutes. Sure. We'll stay on board mm -hmm. if something comes up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do have some questions. Um, I've been uh, responding to people in writing for a little bit here. Some of us have submitted questions regarding other topics that are not addressed in this session. Um, today's session is about the waiver amendments. I know that we had three e-alerts go out that make it a little confusing as to what's happening and what, you know, where where to submit things. Today we're gonna to concentrate, we are concentrating on the waiver amendments and the questions that were about waiver regulations. Um, I am so happy that you wrote them to us because it will be very, very easy for me to forward them to Jetta. And that's okay, but we won't but really talk we can't about that today. I just wanna remind you, Kara, mm -hmm. everyone, we can't accept questions in the chat box. That's, the Department of Law doesn't acknowledge the chat box as a real thing. So you need okay. to send me an email or a letter 
or um, some other communication okay. in writing, um, you can submit waiver amendment questions in this chat box, but you cannot submit regulations amendments in the chat box gotcha. questions. Mm -hmm. And we are having hearings, oral public hearings on the regulations, but it's not interactive at all. We cannot answer questions. We can just thank you for your, your question or your comment and take note of it and then hopefully issue an FAQ later on based on those questions. So I encourage mm -hmm. you to participate in the oral public hearings. One is tomorrow and one is the following Friday. Tomorrow's is on the level of care, IDD level of care regulations, and next Friday at noon is the flexibilities made permanent regulations. And mm -hmm. I apologize that we can't be more interactive, but the Department of Law is very firm about any answer that is provided needs to be made equally accessible to every interested party. And the only way to do that is to put it in an FAQ that is issued through the online public notice system mm -hmm. and by e-alert. Okay, thank, thank you, you Jetta, for that clarification. It's, it, that's great. So if you have questions about waiver regulations, then you're gonna wanna email them to Jetta or mail them to Jetta. Um, I responded to the one that I noticed in here uh, so far and just reminded the person to email to you. And uh, you. probably the most I could do is to just remind people if they have waiver questions to email them. So in any case, we do have them written, so at least I can get back to you and ask you to email them to Jenna or mail them to Jenna. So that's yeah, good. That would be yeah. Good process. Yeah, thank, yeah. You. thank you. Okay, so about the waiver amendments, there are some questions. A few of us have a question about um, the residentially delivered day hab or day hab delivered in a residential setting. How are we going to track that? Will we have different codes? For residential day hab, um, will there be a weekly amount? How will we track the day hab um, delivered in a residence? Very good question. And I will say we haven't worked the kinks out yet and uh, don't have answers to all those questions. Um, I, I would hesitate to say there's going to be a modifier to a procedure code, the day hab procedure code. Um, I think it will be tracked at the level of the support plan with a certain percentage, up to 10% of all day hab provided from all providers, if you shop around and receive your day hab from multiple providers. Um, and the accounting will be on the provider end. You know, we will, I believe, just prior authorize the total amount of day hab, including the 10%, up to 10% that could be done in a residential setting, but we're not gonna add a modifier for a special billing code. If you're audited, you're gonna have to show that you did not provide day hab of more than 10% in total in a residential setting. Um, during the flexibilities, we have been, I will say, very permissive about allowing services to be provided in alternate settings according to our approved Appendix K. We haven't asked um, that that be documented necessarily on the Appendix K short form support plan renewal. Um, we, we really attempted it, but I don't think that we 100% um, were successful, and so it really goes back to the level of the provider uh, tracking where the service is delivered and the day have notes, the case notes that indicate what happened on that day and where you were. So um, I hope that answers the question. Okay. Um, lots of questions coming in about the about awareness of the regulations, um, public comment, and the um there's uh, other questions that are off topic about the tpl that we were discussing yesterday with care coordinators mm -hmm. um i think it might be helpful for us to show the um the website our waiver amendment our waiver website which has the documents related to the waiver amendment so would that be possible to jump out and show that website so people could sure. uh, that, it, look, it looks that? like this screen yeah um, you can also, okay. if you wanted okay. to go live, live to the web page, you could do that. Gotcha. Um, okay, that's okay. Speak, so, just to the, the TPL issue, that e alert went out. Oh, was it just yesterday morning? It seems like forever ago. <laughs> We've had a lot of comments, um, 
it is a state plan amendment. And so it's not a regulation. It can be more interactive. We hope to issue some answers to all the many questions that have been coming in. We're collecting them all now. So thank you for sending your questions to Courtney King. Um, and if you send them to Kara Thrasher Livingston or Lynn Cummins Cruz or me, we're gonna forward them to Courtney because it is her responsibility to handle the state plan amendment that accomplishes this federal requirement. It's a mandate that this happen. This um, services providers must bill any third party insurance um, that is known before billing Medicaid. It's gonna be a big change and we're trying to figure out how it's actually going to be implemented as we speak. And so we uh, don't expect that FAQ to come out in the next day or two. It's gonna take us a week or two to, to, to try to figure out. There's been some very excellent questions arriving in the inbox that make us stop and think, wow, we, uh, we need to think through how this changes things in the MMIS and, and the workflows and Harmony and all that. So hang in there, thank you. Okay, there's a, a question about the public comment session. Is it possible to re to repeat the information to participate in the public comment session? Repeat the information. Public comment accepted until 5 p.m. January 25th. Um, it says there was a, a public comment session mentioned happening tomorrow. There is a public hearing on the regulations, the proposed regulations amending the IDD and community first choice level of care determination process. It is not going to be as interactive as this session because regulations amendments don't allow exchange of answers and questions. It's just gonna be an opportunity for you to provide your comment Unfortunately, not to get an answer during that one hour session. It is tomorrow from 12 to one. It's on the GCI teleconference number. Um, an e-alert went out, gosh, a couple weeks ago on this. Um, you can send me an email if you want to get that e-alert resent to you and I'll do my best to send them out in advance of noon tomorrow. Um, so there's my email right there. Okay, so another question about the waiver amendments. Would the day hab uh, in the home affect group home billing? Well, that's where CMS really drilled down uh, to the duplication of service because a 24 seven um, unit for day hab assumes there is some sort of day habilit a habilitation occurring during the day where you would take your residents out into the community or engage with them in the house, in the residence to uh, do things like attend an exercise class online or um, a painting class or something. Um, and CMS does not want to set up a system or will not approve a system that allows you to duplicate bill. So if for some reason in a group home, existing staff were not able to attend to a recipient's needs and the recipient had normally scheduled day hab out of the home with a different provider essentially a different staff member a different provider and for some reason the day hab worker the dsp wanted to come to the group home and provide that one-on-one -on -one support in the confines of the group home it could be allowed it won't be billed as as group home it would be billed as day hab with a different provider does that make sense? All right, so question says, so day hab would only be able to happen at 10% per recipient in a re residential service. Correct, that's what we propose. CMS didn't wanna put a number on the line, but when we've um, encountered, um, ask them different things about other limitations. They were very narrow and kind of dipping their toe in this water. They really wanna prevent 
day hab from being provided in residential settings because it should be residential habilitation then. The life skills you're working on in a residence should be different than the community oriented skills you're working on when you get day habilitation. It just came up during COVID when we were all trapped in our houses that you and I get to take exercise class on Zoom if we don't feel like going to the gym or the gym is closed. But if you need assistance to operate the technology and you're comfortable with having your DSP come to your house to help hook you up with your iPad or whatever, you sh we should allow people with disabilities to have those services in their homes in a limited amount, not 100% of the time, certainly not 50% of the time, but 10%. We are dipping our toe in the water too. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll just give, give a moment or two here for folks to, to type in their questions. Uh, I am sending folks resources for questions that are outside our topic today, which we've mentioned a couple times. Um, a, a couple of us expressed uh, approval of the change to ISW waitlist selection. Um, and also some a lot of us were happy about the possibility of having some day habilitation occur at the residence. So that you know, those two stuck also, out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If I may, Kara, I love to hear that people are happy with something we're proposing. It makes us feel good, like we're responding to things we know you want. And when we submit it to CMS, we can say these were well received instead of they made people angry. And that makes CMS feel better too. So thank you for those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there were a few a, a few comments about that, about how it was it was working. You know, it, it seemed like a good change. Um, Okay, so there's a few comments. A few of us are, are reconfirming in our understanding that the day hab happening in a residence could be could be up to 10% of the total day hab approved. And it's up to 10% of the total day hab approved. A lot of us are asking like, how do we document that? And how is that gonna be looked after in terms of an audit and things like that? As Jetta stated before, and if I understand it correctly, we're, we're, we're and the details about that are forthcoming. This is just at the, the initial awareness uh, place we're at right now, okay? Correct, correct. Um, and you know, if you're worried yeah. about how this affects the the whole concept is you can't stockpile Dayhab, you can't, what, what's the term? You can't save it up and then use it all in one part of the year. Uh, your support plan needs to account for that and it's sort of, um, distributed on a weekly basis and if you don't use it that doesn't mean you get twice as much the next week because your 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 support plan just doesn't reflect that um this addition this 10 percent that can be in the home would follow those same guidelines so i would just encourage you to look on the sds website for the director's memo that addresses the day have distribution um, where we don't want you to save it up and use it all in one week of the year or something, unless it's approved in your support plan. And so the questions about residences, does this pertain only to licensed residences or is it intending to mean anybody where anybody lives for the residential day have possibility? It's any any place where anybody lives, either in their own home, you know, or their family's home or in a group home or licensed setting. Um, the, the complication for CMS is not wanting to double pay for something. And so if you live in a group home, um, you need to make sure that you explain receiving day hab in your group home is different than the habilitative activities you would normally be getting in your license setting. But whether you live in your own home or you know, your family's home or in a licensed setting, you can get up to 10% of your total day hab hours in a residential setting and you know the other example is being able to go to a birthday party of a friend who happens to live in a group home we have had to deny so many requests 
for people who want to attend a birthday party of a friend who lives in a group home, but they need their DSP to go. And we like, sorry, the CMS guidance says, no, you can't bill for DAB then. You need to find a natural support to take you to that DAB event, um, that birthday party. And now you'll be able to do that. Okay, thank you. A couple questions about uh, kind of circling around understanding the 10%. Um, is it 10% per agency if the person's they have is split up between a few agencies? My best understanding is that no, it is 10% of the total amount of they have approved, regardless Correct. of how many agencies provide it. Yes. And a few more people chimed in and said they thought the proposed changes made sense and would be good changes. Thank you. Uh, the comment that it's uh, it's unfortunate that it's capped at 10% because people who experience complex or medically fragile conditions couldn't really do a lot of things in the community. Is there a way to request additional time over the 10%? There is not a mechanism for that right now. Um, and the corresponding regulations addressing this called flexibilities made permanent that are currently out for public comment have 10 percent embedded in that regulation so if you inadvertently provide more and there isn't a way for the mmis to deny a claim that has more than 10 percent if we don't have that modifier built in you will be found to be in a payback situation and you don't want to do that. So stick to the regulations is my uh, best advice right now. Mm -hmm. Some of us think that it, it, it doesn't make sense to track 10%. It would be hard to track 10%. Um, it would be best if there isn't a percent involved, um, that it should be tied to the person. Uh, Okay, uh, an example would be if an individual has approved 12 hours of weekly support, then they would only be able to use 1.2 hours a week in a home. That is correct. Um, okay. Well, we yeah. appreciate the comments and, you know, we are waiting for CMS to issue the final revision to the technical mm -hmm. guide on changing its mind about any day have at all in any residential setting and maybe they will be more uh, accommodating mm -hmm. in which case we'll be happy to amend our regulations but i feel like we're out on a, mm -hmm. on a branch right now and we just need to see how it goes so yes mm -hmm. we're not going to make everybody happy but i hope it's better than nothing what other comments do you have about this topic um about our waiver amendments and the presentation that jetta has done we're at 10 minutes till sort of 1248. Um, what are your other thoughts? I'm down to the end of my questions right here, right now. And we'll just give people a few moments to, uh, to chat them in. And there's no rule that says that we have to stay till the end if folks are finished for now. Uh, Jetta, you've been really nice and clear with people about ways to engage. It's not just today. So this is another option to engage today. But if we've if we've gone through our, our presentation and Q&A, that's OK as well. If we're a little early, that's OK, too. And there's a thank you for explaining the process. Mm -hmm. And I will say, just like the, the hearing tomorrow on um, IDD level of care, we have the hearing on flexibilities made permanent next Friday the 14th. Um, if you want to submit questions such as why are you limiting it to 10%, um, you would need and you want a response to those before um, you submit your formal public comment, you need to get those questions in by um, Friday the 21st. It's 10 days before public comment closes and the flexibilities made permanent package closes January 31st. So 10 days before that is January 22nd. If you are commenting here that 10% isn't enough, I would also encourage you to make that comment 
of the regulations, because as I said, they go to different audiences. We need to make sure that the final product agrees. One can't be 10% and one be 20%, but you need to comment in both arenas in order to affect change in both sides. All right, thanks everybody. There's a few uh, comments here, uh, mostly um, mostly uh, about flexibility of services and just thinking about different things and where they happen and things like that. Um, there, uh, uh, again, I wanna reiterate that we're not to the point where we could we could say, you know, 10% has to happen in a particular way or a particular time. Um, folks are asking about, does it have to be metered out per week? Could they save up the 10% so that they could go to like a four hour event in the residence or something like that? We're kind of not really at that point yet. I, I, I like what you're asking because, you know, it, it's an alignment with a lot of the things that we teach already about, they have, and I get it. I get why that that's why you're asking, and that's really good. Um, however, we don't have that level of detail right now, and it's it's likely that it will be like like what we already have. Uh, we'll try to make it so that it's not so burdensome for folks to track, you know, um, and to keep that that you know. Again, this is just like the first time that we've had permission to implement the service in the residence, so we'll keep on with CMS with our questions and and hopefully you know it'll be a good starting point um, and a benef you know beneficial for people who do need that. Um, folks are thinking about the pandemic ongoing. Um, this is entirely different than the appendix K flexibilities we have in place right now today. Uh, of course they are it it is permitted in residences today because of the ongoing pandemic. So keep a hold of that, you know, that thought. But this is, you know, for when there's not a pandemic, when there's not exceptions, this is the ongoing ability. Um, uh, folks are asking for, for presentations about regulation amendments and the third party liability. Uh, we hear that, your point is noted. We understand that you are wanting um, information about that. So, so we're working with teams that are implementing that. Of course, there is the public hearing part. Like Jetta said, we're very clear about public hearing um, that you need to be able to provide your comments. And unfortunately, we can't really engage. We just, it's a time for public comment. And those of us who are care coordinators, we did talk about that quite a bit yesterday in our outreach meeting too. Um, suggestion, it would be nice if we had an annual requirement, like no more than 10% of the service annually. Um, otherwise, if it's, a limited amount per week it would be nice if the person could have some extra time for something to be held in the home if it was more than that hour amount like is my my best summary of the feedback coming in uh, there was a question about uh, the ability to provide supported uh, living in the community and i think my best thought there is that um, it's sort of off topic, sort of kinda, uh, but I would invite you to examine our supported living um, conditions of participation around that. And I could probably send you an email too with some resources to answer your question. Okay, it's about five minutes till the top of the hour. Any other thoughts? Anything you would like to submit in the questions area to to Jetta? Can you see if they're typing? Do those little dots appear, Kara? If somebody's thinking. I know, I don't see those. I wish I could, but people oh, okay. have pretty fast fingers, so <laughs> they, <laughs> they type it in very fast, yeah. Folks well, are I do saying appreciate thank you. The question specifically about the day hab and the amount and um, 
we'll definitely take it back to the team. Um, as Kara said, we haven't cast this in stone yet. We're still trying to figure out how it will be implemented and how it will be audited and how much system change versus how much support plan documentation um, it will be um, couched in. So these comments are very useful and um, definitely we take them seriously. So thank you for bringing those up. Are people generally ready to end? Just hit the hand if you're if you feel like it's okay to be done. You want to hit the hand for me? Give me your vote. <laughs> if I get majority of hands held up high. All right. Almost all of us have hands held up high. All right. Okay. Um, so we'll go ahead and close our session. And um, I'll stay on for a minute or two. So if you want to chat in your last couple of comments, that's okay too. Um, but you can definitely jump out if you're ready. We won't do any more presenting. We'll just do some listening here at the end and quiet. And um, I want to thank you, Jetta, for the presentation. And mm -hmm. I would thank you. Yeah. I'd also like to thank our supporting staff, Cassandra Delight and Jenny, for your assistance to present this information today. And thanks to everybody for coming and participating. We really appreciate it. And we like your questions and your engagement. We hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks again. Goodbye for now. Goodbye.